What is going on with gold? Should you consider making it part of your own investment portfolio? You see GLD, the ETF for gold, is up nearly 15% so far in 2024, one of the best performing assets this year. You see some retail investors looking to get in on it with Costco selling nearly $200 million in just the past month in gold and silver. It is worth understanding though, and I'll talk about this dynamic a little bit later in this video, that $200 million isn't really gonna move the needle, I suspect, on the gold market. You're talking about a gold market, I think somewhere between 10, 20 trillion dollars. So 200 million isn't really enough to say, hey, this, this should be a dramatically higher price. Maybe it's a heightened geopolitical concerns as you see the unfortunate state of reality where you have heads of state that are looking to spread chaos, terror, and more broadly send Western civilization back into the dark ages. You know, maybe it's that they have weapons and they're planning on using it and the heightened geopolitical tensions with what what will this do with oil prices in in the weeks and months ahead you also have you know this this bigger and broader question of well if it's not the retail investor because uh, to be to be 100 straight it's usually not the retail investor that moves the individual security it's the institutions that started whether or not it's the pension funds or the central banks and so we want to understand Who's actually buying it here? Who's actually moving gold? And so we'll review some of the usual suspects, especially because when we think about cash, cash is currently yielding, you know, 4.8%, 4.8% plus at Interactive Brokers. See the link below. I mean, you can get bonds that are going out a few years that are of comparable rates, you know, 4 or 5%. And so if you can lock in effectively getting a real yield, why are people moving into an asset where it's very hard to get a yield where you you know it's it's not actually a pro, a productive asset where you're getting you know return each year it really is dependent on the idea that someone will pay more for this underlying you know commodity and so that in in my opinion the the fact that it's been one of the best performing assets so far in 2024 while interest rates are where they are does reflect it's 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 like a poker tell that something is underway because when you have interest rates where they are and cash yielding what it is that's a real opportunity cost and keep in mind if you wanted to buy you know tons of gold you would have to store that somewhere you'd have to protect it that so really what you're talking about is the the folks that are moving this market are turning down the opportunity cost of getting a few percentage on, let's say, treasuries, 4.8% plus on cash. And they're saying we would rather have this arguably unproductive asset that might have optionality in the future. So who are the potential you know, buyers? What are some of the usual suspects? Uh, I think it really comes down to this key idea where a lot of nations saw that Russian assets in US dollars, $300 billion were seized after they invaded Ukraine. And there's this concern, what will the US do? Should I, you know, X country take an initiative that the United States doesn't like? So I think this is a secondary effect from seeing this, which is, okay, so Russian assets were seized, Russian assets were, which, which held, you know, which, which were invested in US securities were seized. So who's potentially buying? I think one key player is potentially the Chinese central bank. And you could see that this has actually been very clearly articulated for several months, where this is Justin Bloomberg talking about how the Chinese central bank has been buying gold for the 17th month, as, even as the prices have hit you know, recent record. And maybe this has to do with potentially the, the geopolitical situation around Taiwan heating up. You know, they might say, hey, we would like to find that we've been articulating for a long time that we are either, you know, this is part of our territory and we want to, you know, take it over. Uh, maybe this is an anticipatory move of let's let's own more gold in advance of maybe a blockade of ta Taiwan. I'm not saying this because I want it. I really do not want that to happen. And I think it would dramatically heighten the geopolitical chaos. You know, supply chains would become a huge issue. I have over 
you know, under my armpit over here, you see uh, chip war. You know, the, if Taiwan gets invaded, you have huge secondary effects in terms of the technology around the world. You know, the AI revolution depends on these chips that are largely produced in Taiwan. So maybe this is a sort of hedge for China's perspective saying, hey, we, we don't just want to own U.S. treasuries. We need to own you know, something like gold to protect us uh, from, let's say, a U.S. response if we were to do something that the U.S. wouldn't like. Another aspect, another buyer, a big buyer, uh, another central bank is in India, where they, you know, different accounts have suggested that their gold imports have surged over 100 uh, percent in the last few months. And, you know, this this angle itself, I don't really see unless it's India is not going to, let's say, directly get in line with some of the requests that the the U.S. government has. You know, they want to have their own sovereignty. Totally makes sense, especially given their history. You know, you don't want someone else calling the shots. They want to call their own shots in this century. And it, and it might also be a reflection on the underlying fiscal mess that is the U.S. House where you this is actually an interesting chart because usually you see the deficit as a percentage of GDP. This shows the actual dollar deficit. And you can see that historically, you know, even during World War Two, it's effectively a blip on an absolute dollar basis. And really the last few years, it's just gone bananas in terms of the actual dollar spending. Once again, this isn't, you know, it does this doesn't capture the second half of the picture, which is that the GDP is has gone up significantly. But still, this is not the type of stock chart you'd want to invest in where you see like, whoa, you know, just unbelievable, tr you know, trillions of dollars, 1.7 trillions of dollars, because this this number is in millions of millions, billions, trillions, trillions of dollars of annual deficits. And so this is not what you want to see. So maybe this is India saying, hey, we want just to diversify against an unreliable counterparty. And maybe this is the end of the U.S. dollar, you know, as a reserve currency over time. You know, maybe, who knows how when that exactly plays out. Now, I, you know, the question is, should you consider buying gold? And I'm going to share, you know, a couple of different perspectives. First, though, in full disclosure, this is not financial advice. Also, recently, a premium member of the Unrivaled Investing Community shared the following. This is a direct quote. I got introduced to the markets as a speculator during the 2020-2021 bubble. Your content really helped me understand long-term investing. Most of the online friends I made during the bubble are still speculating. I'm trying to convince them to join your membership. The unrealized profits from, and he mentions two different stocks, is enough to cover 302 years of membership. So check it out yourself if you're interested in looking for compelling investment ideas, or if you just want to learn about the basics of investing, such as you know how to read a financial statement. I do have courses on how to read financial statement as well as a uh, valuation framework. This is what I would have wanted to know before my own personal experience working on the Wall Street uh, sell side, as well as multi-billion dollar long long short hedge fund. So when I think about gold, I actually have multiple different views and I've owned gold in the past. Um, my first view when I think about, you know, the the range of of considerations, one is the view from Buffett where, you know, he sort of described it. And I think this may have been back over a decade ago where he he said, look, you could take all the gold, tons of gold and make this giant cube. And all the gold that's been mined throughout history, make this giant cube and, you know, it's, it make it and call it pile A. And it would be the equivalent of you know, like a $10 trillion. Now it's probably closer to $20 trillion. But that giant cube would still comfortably fit in the infield of a baseball diamond. So that's why that picture. And at the end of 10 years, if you could either own that cube at the end of those 10 years, you'd still just have that cube. Um, oops, looks like I didn't button this button. I didn't mean to flash the camera or anything. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, you have this asset and it's not really producing anything. It's what you're looking at is something where, you know, Buffett says, I wouldn't want to own gold because it's not a productive asset. And he also compares it to, let's say, buying all this farmland and all these productive companies that he'd much rather own that basket, which is producing goods that people want versus something where, you know, he makes a point like, hey, you could fondle it, you could touch it, you can, you know, you could do whatever you want to it. But at the end of the day, it's still just going to be that 
pile of gold. So that's one perspective. The other perspective, uh, and I and I think Buffett's perspective is it, it is important to reflect on it because it is grounded in history. You know, you you go back several centuries and owning U.S. stocks this is a chart from Jeremy Siegel. You know, owning U.S. stocks is just dramatically outpaced everything. Bonds, short term bonds, bills, gold, U.S. dollar, and that you are better off owning. Uh, and this is, I think, inflation adjusted. You are better off owning stocks and just accepting that volatility than to try to outsmart yourself with gold. I think that's the, the real key takeaway. The other end of the spectrum, Ray Dalio, where he makes the case that, look, you occasionally live through periods of chaos. And maybe that's the unfortunate reality that we're starting to live in. Maybe that's because the U.S. House you know, deficit is out of order and you have a lot of countries that you know rightfully have their own sovereignty, China, India, that say, hey, we don't want to have to rely on your financial system and your potential financial penalties. You're running, you know, multiple deficits and huge problems, and we don't really want a part of it. And we we have our own agenda. Uh, some of which on a geopolitical basis makes everyone uncomfortable, like China taking over Taiwan, but some of which is might just be completely independent, like like India. And so I I look at this and I think. You know, there's there's also Dalio's perspective, which is, hey, every investor, maybe it makes sense to have a diversified bet where you have instead of a cash allocation, you have a couple percent allocated to gold. I don't I don't find fault with really either perspective. I, I definitely understand it, uh, recognizing that maybe there are occasional periods of chaos where this will outperform. Personally, I would rather align myself more in the camp of Buffett where it's owning great companies, where I'm comfortable that they will compound regardless of the environment in the years ahead, that the underlying business has a value proposition or has a business model such that I think they'll be bigger in the years ahead. And I call out those types of companies. I even called out Fairfax previously on this channel, one of my largest holdings, which is, you know, I just think it's very likely to be much bigger in the years ahead. So I, I can I can understand the different perspectives on gold. And if you're a gold bug, you know, I, I hope it works out for you. Uh, I, 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 I don't hope that you have the geopolitical risks and geopolitical events that cause it to, to work out for you. But I, you know, I, I don't I don't have anything against it, um, you know, other than the aspect that it's not really a productive asset. It's a it's really an asset that you're relying on sort of the greater fool theory. Will someone else pay more for this in the future as a, you know, as a, as a storehold of value, you know, something that will store the value over time. So broadly, I would rather, I, th I think the main takeaway that investors should, should consider is what type of investor are you? Are you looking to be a trend follower? And, and I'm, there's nothing wrong with this. There are some very, very successful trend following investors that would say, hey, you know, gold recently broke out higher. Therefore, it's going to be on my short, you know, shopping list to buy. And, you know, I'm going to watch it. So I, I don't find fault in that. And maybe it does, you know, continue to rip higher. Personally, I'd rather have the more, oppor you know, the opportunistic as well as optimist, optimistic take of saying, I don't want to think that the world's going to go into chaos. Maybe it will, but I'd rather align myself with, businesses and ultimately management that I like. And that, that gives me a warm and sort of fuzzy feeling every day thinking about, hmm, I wonder how this business is executing, what they're building, what are the new products. And I enjoy that more versus thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this crazy monkey of a terrorist, you know, has got some missiles and he's going to be sending it over here in this peace loving country. Like that's, that is not, and, and oh, how can I profit from that? Like that is not, how I personally want to spend my journey, but I, I understand other people, you know, are, are looking for the day to day. Hey, how can I make a buck? And this is breaking higher. So I understand. So I hope this video talking about gold, sort of the nuances has been helpful for you. Uh, if you have a different take, as always, would love to read it in the comments below. Thanks so much for tuning into Unrivaled Investing.